Thank you all for coming to the Early Career Immunology Seminar. I'm Timo Sullivan, an Assistant Professor of Immunology at UCLA. Uh, to recap, the purpose of the seminar series is to increase the exposure of early career faculty in a time which we have not achieved equity and representation at scientific conferences and seminars despite equally innovative discoveries. So we're excited to have Kiki Fairfax with us today from the University of Utah. She received her PhD with distinction from Yale and continued her work with Ed Pierce at WashU as a UNCF Merck po uh, postdoctoral fellow before joining the Department of Pathology at U of U. Kiki's research focuses using uh, helminths, parasites, um, as a tool to understand both the consequences of IL-4 induced immunomodulation and the complex interplay between B, T, and stromal cells that are necessary to develop uh, optimal T and B cell memory responses. Kiki has performed important work showing that IL-4 is a key homeostatic cytokine necessary for maintaining both follicular dendritic cell and uh, lymphatic endothelial cell homeostasis. Currently, a large focus of her research is determining the immunological consequences of an in utero antigen exposure during maternal um, uh, pathogen exposure uh, on offspring. And she also wants to understand the mechanistic underpinnings of reduced immunity to heterologous immunization, um, which we should hear more about today, hopefully. Uh, thank you for joining us today, Kiki, and take it away. All right, thank you, Tim. Um, so today uh, I'm gonna do something unusual for me um, and focus on uh, a single story. Um, and I'm going to show you both uh, published data uh, that was just published in February in PLOS Pathogens, um, along with a lot of unpublished data. Um, I am withholding some things uh, that we're not ready to make public yet, but uh, you will see how this story is continuing and uh, will hopefully be published uh, at the beginning of next year. Um, so the title is Using Helminths to Expose the Role of Pathogens in Modulating Host immune development. Um, and so this project uh, is a project on schistosomiasis. So just a little bit of a background for people that are not uh, parasitologists. Um, schistosomiasis is caused by uh, parasites of the genus schistosoma. My lab works on schistosoma mansoni, which is endemic to sub-Saharan Africa, um, South America, and the Caribbean. Uh, there are other species that infect humans um, also in Africa and uh, Southeast Asia, um, but my lab focuses mainly on Mansoni. Um, and so most of the pathology of disease is not due to the adult worms themselves, but it's due to granulomatous inflammation around parasite eggs. So adult worms, um, when they are sexually mature, live for Mansoni in the mesenteric veins and portal vasculature um, where they pair and uh, secrete eggs. The eggs would like to transit down, break out across the lumen of the gut and be excreted in the feces. Unfortunately, blood flows up in mammals. And so 40 to 60% of the eggs end up lodged in the liver. And that's what leads to the vast majority of pathology in people infected with schistosomiasis. So the end result is hepatic fibrosis and in severe cases, portal and pulmonary hypertension. So the immune response uh, against these eggs is associated with a marked TH2 response, um, eosinophilia in the blood, alternative mac activation of macrophages in the gut, in the liver, and in the peritoneal cavity, and the generation of uh, a B cell response that in mice is predominated by IgG1 and IgE, and in humans is predominated by G1, G4, and E. Um, and so the story that I'm gonna talk to you about today um, focuses on the role of egg antigens and uh, really understanding this uh, B cell response. Um, and so the reason our, our lab works on maternal schistosomiasis is driven by a core insight uh, that we had in the field um, over 20 years ago, uh, which is that relative vaccine efficacy in resource poor countries is often significantly lower than what is realized in the developed world. We know that this is multifactorial but there is strong evidence that the chronic presence of both prenatal and early childhood, so before the age of five, parasitic infections undermines the development of effective immune responses to certain vaccines. Now, this is really important from a public health standpoint because over 40 million women of childbearing age in the developing world are at risk 
for schistosomiasis, and at least 10 million women in Africa are diagnosed with schistosomiasis um, annually. So this is a really uh, important public health problem um, for a large portion of the world's population. Um, and so maternal schistosomiasis uh, exposes offspring in utero and in early life to antigens via two mechanisms. Um, as I said before, we believe that most of uh, the immunomodulation comes from the eggs, and I'll, I'll show you data that formally proves that. Um, and so in utero, offspring are exposed to egg antigens um, via the placenta. Um, and then after birth, children are then also exposed to both antigens in the breast milk and S. mansoni antibodies in the breast milk. Um, and multiple other groups have uh, demonstrated that you can measure both um, schistosoma antigens and antibodies in the breast milk. So there's two routes for exposure here. Um, so about six years ago uh, or so, um, when I started my lab, I set out to develop a mouse model of maternal schistosomiasis that would allow us to really understand um, what IL-4 is doing in the system and mechanistically what is happening uh, with B and T and TFH cell development after immunization. Um, and so to really be able to do that, uh, we use a, a workhorse for, for our lab and, and for many other labs, um, set of mice uh, that are a combination of forget homozygous and KN2 homozygous mice. Um, and so the forget homozygous report IL-4, uh, just the loci opening by putting GFP on the surface. Um, and the KN2 allele actually reports IL-4 secretion by putting human CD2 on the surface of the cell. And so we infect either forget homozygous mothers or forget KN2 heterozygous mothers, which is important for one uh, piece of data I'm gonna show you in this presentation. Um, and then, uh, we infect them at six to eight weeks old. And then at five weeks of infection, we then mate them. Um, and this allows uh, for egg exposure to the offspring developing in utero for the entire development of um, their life. Um, and so we've done this in both acutely infected mice as well as chronically infected mice. Uh, in the data that I'm gonna show you, the the longest time point in infection of the mother is 22 weeks. Um, and so this is a really robust phenotype that is not dependent on whether it's acute versus chronic infection in the mother. Um, we wean this mice at, these mice at 28 days old, um, and that's because they are smaller than uh, mice from uninfected mothers. Um, and in the case of forget kn 2s mothers, we do genotype them before we use them. Um, we use them at steady state, uh, ideally at 28 days old, but we'll go as old as 35 days old. Um, and then they're immunized in the same time window. Um, so I'm going to show you data from uh, primary immunization. Um, we have published data from memory, which is 60 days post and secondary immunization, but I will not show you that data in this presentation for the sake of time. But it is in this paper that was published in February. Um, so one of the most important things when you're setting up a new model where you're hoping to get mechanistic insight into a human disease is does it phenocopy the parameters we know of uh, human infection? Um, and so in this case, human maternal schistosomiasis. So we know in humans that there is a correlation between offspring titer uh, against SEA antigens and maternal titer of SEA against SEA antigens. Um, so that's one of the first things we did. And so we can measure at this 35 day time point, um, a very robust anti-SEA IgG1 titer in these offspring. Um, it does decrease slightly at 90 days. Um, and then by 180 days of life, uh, you do have heterogeneity in across mice in these. And so this is showing you a single set of litters across 180 days, but this has been done well over five times. Um, and we actually see a very robust correlation, R squared uh, value of 0.9 between the maternal log 10 anti-SEA IgG1 titer and the offspring log 10 anti-SEA IgG1 titer. Um, and so 
the, the question that we've had in the field is that how much of this is transfer of maternal immune responses to the offspring versus generating uh, an immune response in the offspring at this really early uh, time in life. Um, and so here we utilized our ability to infect for get KN2 mothers. Um, and so when they're, they're bred with KN2 fathers, you get mixed litter mates. Um, and so some will be heterozygotes for forget KN2s and some will be KN2 homozygous. Um, and so I'm showing you uh, litter mates. So they have matched exposure to maternal antibody. Um, and again, this has been replicated many times. Um, so you see that there's no statistical difference between uh, the anti seaig one titers and offspring that are either forget KN2 or KN2 homozygous. And this is really important because um, many years ago, uh, six, seven years ago, uh, I demonstrated that KN2 homozygous uh, mice are unable to class switch to IgG1 uh, just by immunization with SEA. So we assume that any antibody in these mice has to come from the mother who was IL-4 competent. Um, and so we see identical decay of this antibody over a three month time, time period, really suggesting that all of this antibody or the bulk of this antibody is coming from the mother. Um, that being said, we do believe that there is some transfer, uh, there, there is something going on in the offspring's immune response, which I will uh, get to in the unpublished part of the presentation. Um, and so when we look at plasma cells in the popliteal lymph node, which is the lymph node that we use as our, our draining lymph node for all of our immunizations, because um, we immunize in the foot, we see that there's a significant reduction in offspring plasma cells in the uh, pups born to infected mothers, and this is quantified here. We can also see that in an organ draining lymph node, so this isn't limited to peripheral lymph nodes. Um, so you again have a 50% reduction in plasma cells in the hepatic lymph node of offspring born to infected mothers. So even though we believe that this antigen specific antibody is being trafficked from the mother um, that's in the offspring, we do see that there is a reduction in uh, plasma cell generation. And these are likely all against microbiota um, at this early time point in life in these offspring. So there does seem to be a defect in humoral immunity. Um, and so, we then decided to actually look at uh, the structure of the popliteal lymph node. We previously published back in 2019 that uh, IL-4 modulates the lymphocyte stromal cell axis in the periphery. Um, and since you know, these offspring are coming from an in utero environment where the mother will be making large quantities of IL-4, it was one of the obvious things for us to look at. And, and one of the reasons we were using these reporters in the first place. So when we looked at these lymph nodes, again, this is steady state, this is unimmunized. Um, we see the organization we would expect in offspring from uninfected mothers. So you have nice large B cell follicles that are ringing the lymph node. Um, and there's a cap of FDC M2 positive follicular dendritic cells on the top of each B cell follicle. Now, when you look at the popliteal lymph nodes from offspring born to infected mothers, um, I hope you can appreciate that there's much less CD2135. Each of these B cell follicles is smaller and more diffuse. Um, and you don't have a tight, tight cap of follicular dendritic cells here. So it started to suggest to us that this lymphocyte stromal cell axis and the organization of the B cell follicle is impaired to some degree in these mice. Um, and so we quantified here the CD2135 area. Uh, which are important complement receptors, important for uh, B cell co-stimulation and maintenance of memory B cells. Um, so this suggested that we do have a problem with follicular dendritic cells here. So we quantify this via flow cytometry. And there are three types of follicular dendritic cells, at least three types. Um, single positives for 2135, double positives, um, and single FDCM2 positives. And all three flavors are reduced in offspring born to infected mothers by about 50% uh, for each population. Um, and this is quantified here with absolute number of follicular dendritic cells in the lymph node. Um, so we really start to think that these offspring at the, the time that they're first weaned have a defect in the stromal compartment of their peripheral lymph nodes. Um, and so, we then wanted to 
utilize our GFP reporters to actually look at circulating TH2 cells in the blood. So if we look at in the PBMCs and we look for GFP positive CD4s, um, these are all uh, TH2 cells, um, we actually see a significant reduction in circulating TH2 cells in offspring born to infected mothers. And again, this is the opposite of what both myself and most other people in the field uh, assumed would happen since again, the mothers are making more IL-4 than the mothers uh, that are uninfected. Um, so they're actually, we're starting to think that there's a defect in IL-4 or the generation of Th2 cells um, in offspring born to infected mothers. Um, so one really important molecule for B cell survival is BAF receptor. Um, and so if we look at BAF receptor expression, on the surface of all CD19 positive cells, so just bulk, we see that it is significantly reduced in the popliteal lymph node in offspring born to infected mothers. Um, and it's also reduced on if we uh, subpopulate memory B cells and plasma cells. So this key survival signal for B cells we see is reduced in all populations, all, in, all of the important populations of, of follicular B cells. Um, so again, this fits with the plasma cell, uh, phenotype where we see fewer circulating pa uh, plasma cells, and, and BAF receptor is one of the ways in which we could lose plasma cells. Um, and so does this make sense in the context of the epidemiological data? So a study back in 2016 done by Dan Colley's group uh, in young adult males found that a current infection with S. Vance and I uh, led to a reduction in the duration of protective antibody titers to both hepatitis B and tetanus toxoid. Um, and then a recent Human maternal schistosomiasis study, again from Dan Colley's group uh, with uh, Bart Ondigo as the first author, um, demonstrated reduced long-term anti-measles titers in vaccinated children born to infected mothers. Now, neither of these studies uh, looked at, at B cells themselves. Um, the outcome measure here was, was simply antibody, uh, which is what's important for vaccination. Um, but both of these, uh, and so here's the data here of these anti-measles IgG being reduced in offspring born to S. mansoni positive mothers. Um, and this is at 18 years of, 18 months of age. Um, so both of these outcomes would be predicted in a model of reduced 2135 expression on follicular dendritic cells based on what we know about the role of follicular dendritic cells in maintaining uh, memory B cells and, and generating plasma cells. Um, so it seems that our, our mechanism so far fits with the human data that we have. Um, so I'm just going to give you a recap of what we know about important follicular dendritic cell B cell interactions. Um, so I alluded to BAF receptor on B cells and FDCs actually can secrete BAF and it's really important for proliferation of B cells. Um, they provide anti-apoptotic signals uh, via immune complexes uh, to B cells. Um, they are also really important for uh, generating TFH cells, which are then able to generate T cell dependent antibody responses. Um, and we showed back in our 2019 uh, paper that uh, they actually express IL-4 receptor alpha um, and respond to IL-4 and that IL-4 is important for their homeostatic maintenance. Um, so when you lack IL-4 signaling or you have reduced IL-4 signaling on FDCs, you reduce numbers and then also the functionality in CD2135 um, is what we showed in, in 2019. So all the data is starting to suggest that what we might have here is a defect in IL-4 regulating this lymphocyte stromal cell access. Now in that 2019 paper, um, we demonstrated that IL-4 was critical for the lymphocyte stromal cell access, but we never determined at steady state um, what cell type makes IL-4. Um, so we, we set out to understand who makes IL-4 at this really early time point in age. Again, these are 28 day old mice. Um, and so we exhaustively looked across uh, gamma delta T cells, alpha beta T cells, NK cells, um, and INK T cells. And the take home of this very busy uh, set of data is that only INK T cells secrete IL-4 in the lymph node in offspring from uninfected mothers. And again, this is unimmunized, okay? So we already knew that TFH cells make IL-4 in an immunized state or an infected state, but this is the steady state production of IL-4. 
Um, when you look at this population in offspring born to infected mothers, um, you see that it's not zero IL-4, but it is a dramatic reduction. And you don't have a compensatory increase of IL-4 from any other population. So you don't now have alpha beta T cells making IL-4. Um, they're, they're still about the same amount of IL-4 here. Um, so this really suggests that there is a homeostatic reduction in the production of IL-4, at least in the peripheral lymph nodes. Um, so what happens after immunization? So we immunized with a human tetanus diphtheria vaccine. Um, and this is looking at eight days post immunization, which is the, the peak of the T follicular helper cell response, but not uh, the germinal center uh, B cell response. And so if we, again, these are confocal tile scans. Um, so then if we look in offspring born to uninfected mothers, um, so in white, you have GL7, which is a germinal center marker. In green, you have CD4 for your T cells. Uh, red is human CD or human CD2 reporter. So that represents IL-4 secretion. Um, and IL-4 secreting TFH cells are actually gonna be all three of these colors. And so they look like this orangey that you can see here. Um, so I hope you can appreciate that one, this germinal center is much larger in the offspring born to uninfected mothers than born to infected mothers, but there's also significantly more IL-4 secreting T cells within the center of the germinal center in offspring born to uninfected mothers than to infected mothers. Um, there's actually only one in this particular section and it's on the periphery of the germinal center, which would not be considered a true GC TFH cell. Um, so IL-4 secretion within the germinal center reaction itself is dramatically reduced in these offspring born to infected mothers. Um, and this is just a quantification of the area of the germinal center. Um, and so what does this mean functionally? Well, it leads to reduced germinal center B cells, reduced plasma cells, and reduced memory B cells, again, at this day or a time point. Um, so then, of course, the questions you always have when you're dealing with uh, immune responses to vaccination or to infection is, is this a true reduction or is this a kinetic shift? Um, so if we look at day 14, um, we see that it's not just a delay. So even when we look at day 14, you still have this reduction of T follicular helper cells here. Um, and this, uh, you can see it reduced both frequency and absolute cell number. Um, you still have a defect in follicular dendritic cells, uh, which we showed at steady state. So again, all three populations of follicular dendritic cells are reduced here. Um, and importantly, you have a reduction in your memory T cell response. Um, and so these uh, IL-7 receptor high GFP positive cells that would be here, are we know are the important memory precursors for secondary TFH cell response. Um, and they're reduced by over 50%. Um, and then of course you have the reduction in plasma cells that we've seen consistently at all time points. Um, and importantly on these follicular dendritic cells, it's not just that we have a reduction in numbers, um, but we actually have a reduction in the MFI of the CD2135 on the surface, which again are complement receptors that are really essential for presenting immune complexes to B cells um, as part of a retention mechanism for memory B cells as well uh, as stimulating primary B cell responses. And so this would suggest that there's fewer molecules of CD2135 on each of these FDCs in addition to having reduced numbers of FDCs. Um, so what does the, the germinal center reaction look like uh, at 14 days? So again, this is an entire lymph node, uh, again, with a confocal tile scan um, and Z-stack. Uh, and I hope you can appreciate uh, that you have nice large germinal centers ringing the entire lymph node here in the offspring born to uninfected mothers. But when you look at the offspring born to infected mothers, um, you have the same number, but every single one of these germinal centers is smaller and more diffuse than in the control offspring. If you zoom in on a single germinal center, so here we're gonna look at this one, um, you see that in the offspring born to uninfected mothers, there's a nice cap of CD2135 FDCM2 double positive. So that's displaying as this hot pink here, cells at the top of the lymph node uh, where you would expect. Um, and then when you look at the, uh, a single germinal center, we're gonna zoom in on this one, in the offspring born to infected mothers, you don't have a tight cap, you have a diffusion 
of the CD2135 positive cells, um, and they don't appear to be in direct contact with the germinal center B cells. Um, and we know that these are really important contact dependent interactions between the FDC and, and the germinal center B cell. Um, so if we quantify this reduction in follicular dendritic cell area here, uh, you can see that it's very dramatic. So there is a correlation in the offspring's uh, anti-diphtheria titer at this 14 day time point and their anti-SEA titer uh, down here, um, <clears throat> but there isn't a tight correlation with tetanus, um, which we've seen uh, in other scenarios um, that we've published in, in 2019. There can be a disconnect between the anti-tetanus response and the anti-diphtheria response. Um, and so, we wanted to understand mechanistically uh, what transcriptomically could be controlling this defect in what is both T cell and B cell uh, appears to be both prolifer proliferation and differentiation. Um, so we took a single cell RNA uh, sequencing approach. Um, and so again, we immunized uh, forget KN2 offspring. Um, and the offspring in this experiment were between 28 and 35 days old, most were 33, um, but this was two litters mixed together. Um, and we immunized them and, and day eight post immunization, uh, we sacrificed for uh, RNA sequencing and we sorted CD45 positive cells. Um, I'm not gonna show you the clustering, but it is in the paper. Um, what I will show you are uh, the transcripts we really think are important in, in terms of B cells. Um, one of the important things we had in this experiment, though, um, that I, I want to make sure everybody understands, is that uh, in addition to the offspring from infected and uninfected mothers that we've had in every other experiment, we also had a set of mothers that were uh, infected with a single sex of schistosoma mansoni. So they were either infected with only females or only males. Um, and so there were no eggs being laid. Um, and so this is a really important control because it allows us to determine what is egg antigen dependent versus what could be driven by adult worm antigens. Um, and so on these graphs, uh, the yellow here, group C, are the offspring from single sex infected mothers. And we did confirm that these were single sex with perfusion after these pups were weaned. Um, and so you can see that uh, there's a reduction in EBF1, which is a really important transcription factor for B cell identity, um, only in the offspring born to patently infected mothers where you have egg antigens. So this is an egg dependent uh, phenomenon. We also have an increase in June and June B and a decrease in RBX1 and TMSB10. I'm only showing you uh, one follicular B cell cluster. There were, uh, there were four. Um, and all of the data is in the paper, but all of these are consistent across the follicular B cell clusters. If you look at the germinal center B cell cluster, again, you have this reduction in EB, EBF1, uh, and you also have a reduction in HMGB2, RBX1, and TMSB10 as well. Um, so this suggests that there, uh, this increase in June B particularly would suggest that there might be cell cycle defects. And then this reduction in EBF1 um, EBF1 is important for one, B cell identity, but also proliferation and differentiation. Um, and so this starts to suggest a transcriptional profile that is making these B cells less able to do all B cell functions, right? Um, not shown here, uh, but can be found in the data um, as we've gone back in is that there's actually also a very strong signature of reduction of uh, ability to signal through the B cell receptor. Um, which I'll get into some of that in our unpublished data. Um, but we, we left this here. We did confirm, uh, again, I'm not gonna show you for the interest of time, but we did confirm uh, that the offspring born to infected mothers, their B cycles uh, have, uh, their B cells have less KI67. Um, they do have less EBF1 protein, so not just transcript, but also protein. Um, and so they have a reduced ability to proliferate following immunization. Um, as well as at steady state. Um, and so I'm gonna leave you with the model that we had in the paper for how we believe that this exposure is modulating offspring immunity. Um, so in uh, normal situations, you have offspring born to uninfected mothers. These are ostensibly um, naive offspring that secrete IL-4 
uh, via their INKT cells that's responsible for maintaining this lymphocyte stromal cell access. So you have normal numbers of uh, follicular cells, a normal B cell follicle, um, and you have a good T cell border. When you immunize these mice, you develop a nice robust germinal center reaction and expansion of both T follicular helper cells and memory B cells. Now in the offspring born to infected mothers, you have the same number of INKT cells, but they secrete much less IL-4. Um, and that leads to a reduction in number of FDCs, but also in amount of CD2135, um, which doesn't reduce the number of B cells at steady state, but does reduce their functionality, such that when you immunize, you have a reduced GC response, reduced generation of memory B cells and T follicular helper cells. Um, and functionally, this leads to less anti-diphtheria antibody available. Um, so that's where we left that story uh, and is published uh, in PLOS Pathogens. Um, so I'm gonna tell you where this story has evolved uh, over the last about nine, 12 months um, and, and what we're currently working on for another publication. Um, and so the question we had, particularly after the single cell RNA-seq data um, with that EBF1 being reduced in every single B cell cluster um, is understanding what links the cellular and humoral defects in steady state and following immunization? Is this EBF1 a clue for us um, as to what mechanistically could be going on? Um, and so we, we took a step back um, and started to think about hematopoiesis. Um, so I'm gonna give you a, a little reminder of uh, hematopoietic cells in the bone marrow, uh, which is where B cells come from. Um, and so there are the HSPCs, uh, the hematopoietic uh, stem cells that are pluripotent. They can differentiate into MPP1s, which can then make MPP2s, which lead to the megakaryocyte erythrocyte line, MPP3s, which give you most of your myeloid cells, and MPP4s, also called LMPPs for uh, the lymphoid uh, restricted progenitors. Um, I will note that LMPPs can also directly make uh, GMPs or the granulocyte macrophage progenitor uh, in a FLT3 ligand dependent manner. But their primary function um, in, in most homeostasis is to generate the common lymphoid progenitor here or CLPs. Um, and so, I, I left you in, in the last paper in the periphery with this significant reduction in EBF1 in all B cells. Um, and so what do we know about EBF1 in terms of uh, hematopoietic and then more importantly, B cell development? Well, we, we know that um, if you knock out EBF1 in these early uh, lymphoid progenitors here, that would be ELPs that are lymphoid restricted, um, you have lower IgG heavy chain recombination frequency. You have degree, decreased E2A and PAX5 expression. You have impaired BCR signaling. And in response to immunization, you have lower germinal center frequency. Um, and so we wanted to start to understand what is going on in this differentiation and, and is it EBF1 that could be playing a role here? And this is just demonstrating some of the things that EBF1 can do at each of these stages. Um, so the experimental design here is again, we all of the offspring we're using are for GitKN2 heterozygous. Um, and we have offspring from uninfected and infected mothers. Um, so here we're, we're doing all steady state. Um, and then I will, uh, I'll tie it back into the immunization data that I showed you at the first part of the talk. Um, so we're doing flow cytometry and then single and bulk RNA sequencing. So the questions we're gonna try to answer here, is there a defect early in hematopoiesis um, or does this start at the, the common lymphoid progenitor level? Is EBF1 expression decreased in these lymphoid progenitors of pups from infected mothers? So does it mirror what we see in the periphery? Is EBF1 expression decreased in early B cells? Um, so once you have differentiation going on, but before they exit to the periphery. Um, so this is all unpublished data uh, by fabulous grad student, uh, Lisa Gibbs. Um, and so here I'm just showing you how we gate LMPPs, uh, all of the MPPs 
are start off of this gate and then we subgate. Um, and then these are your HSPCs that are FLT3 negative. Um, and so if we look at offspring from infected mothers in black and, uh, sorry, uninfected mothers in black and infected mothers in purple, um, we see that for the HSPCs, there is a decrease in frequency. This is also true for total cell number. Um, I'm just not showing you the absolute numbers here because uh, we're going to do some ratios in a little bit. Um, but there is a significant reduction in HSPCs, uh, sorry, a significant increase in HSPCs and offspring born to infected mothers, and then a decrease of um, MPPs, and then a decrease of LMPPs. So this would be MPPs uh, one through three uh, here. And then here I'm showing you MPP4, which is also called LMPP. So there's a significant decrease of the LMPPs um, and a decrease of all of the MPPs uh, pulled together. Um, I will tell you that uh, most of this is, is being driven by a difference in MPP2 um, here. Uh, sorry, one, but I'm not gonna show you that for the sake of time. So when we look at HSPCs, um, we have this increased cell number but we actually have a decrease in KI67, so active progression through cell cycle, and then an increase in caspase three. So while there's more of these HSPCs, we think that they're ending up undergoing apoptosis here. Um, so that functionally you're generating fewer MPPs and LMPPs. Um, that's the, the way in which we're envisioning this now. And, and this, increase in caspase three is fairly robust across uh, at least four litters so far, I believe. Um, so this really does seem to suggest that they're not proliferating um, and they're instead dying, even though you started off with more of them. Um, and so we wanted to understand transcriptomically what could happen. So what we sorted were lineage negative, CKIT positive, SCA1 positive cells. Um, from male mice born to infected or uninfected mothers. This gets you a mix of all the lymphoid um, restricted progenitors, so CLPs um, and LMPPs, and then it also gets you HSPCs. Um, so what you're losing here are differentiated myeloid or erythroid progenitors. So we're really trying to narrow in on, on the lymphoid lineage. Um, and what's really striking is that there's a dramatic reduction in a lot of really key genes for progenitor identity, right? Um, so, or increase. So you have an increase in ID2 um, with a decrease in TCF3. Um, you have key metabolic genes that my lab has worked on on a different project being altered. And then a lot of genes involved in cell cycle altered. Um, and so if we look at cell cycle, we see that there's a significant number of genes, and this is a significantly altered pathway uh, via pathway analysis. Um, there's a significant number of genes involved in, CC, in cell cycle. Um, ESP1 is, uh, was one of the more important ones, we believe, um, that are significantly reduced in offspring born to infected mothers. And if you look at pluripotency of stem cells, you have this significant increase in ID2 with a decrease in TCF3, um, suggesting that these cells would be more restricted in their pluripotency. Um, and then there's also a decrease that we consistently see in the, the JAK-STAT pathway. Um, and so we wanted to start to understand, um, particularly with this increase in ID2 and this decrease in TCF3, um, are these CLPs normal, right? Um, so in a normal situation, if you gated CLPs, um, you could look at T cell skewing versus B cell skewing. Um, and you'd have pretty close to a one-to-one -one ratio between T cell skewed CLPs and B cell skewed CLPs. Um, and that's what you need to maintain both cell populations. Um, so if we look at the CLPs and the offspring born to infected mothers, again, the purple is offspring born to infected mothers, the black is offspring born to uninfected mothers. We see an increase in the frequency of CLPs but they're dramatically shifting towards B cell skewed, right? So in the offspring born to uninfected mothers, this is about a one, a ratio of one to one. Um, but here you're shifting very dramatically towards B cell skewed uh, as opposed to T cell skewed um, CLPs. Um, 
And then if we look at EBF1, which is what brought us into the bone marrow in the first place, we actually see that there is a significant reduction in EBF1 in all CLPs, regardless of whether they're, they're B or T cell skewed. So it starts to, to suggest to us that the offspring born to infected mothers are attempting to make a lot of B cells here um, at the expense of T cells. Are those B cells functional? Because out in the periphery, they don't appear to be. We're gonna try to find out. Um, and so this is a reminder because I know a lot of people don't do bone marrow uh, B cell differentiation and maturation. Um, so a reminder for all of us uh, that from the hematopoietic stem cell, you get your LM, you get your MPP, which gets you your LMPP, your common lymphoid progenitor, and then uh, your B cell skewed common lymphoid progenitors will differentiate into pro pre B cells, which then differentiate into pro B cells. At your pre B cell level, you now uh, have your heavy and light chain rearrangement and you have a, a BCR. You have positive selection, which is dependent um, on assessing this BCR. Then you have receptor editing and negative selection, uh, ostensibly to edit out autoreactive B cells. Um, and then you have your transitional B cell, uh, which then can go into the periphery and become a mature B cell. And this is just the surface markers we use for these. Um, so if we look at pre-pro B cells, um, we see that there is no difference in pre-pro B cells between offspring born to infected and uninfected mothers. Um, in this graphic, these are the pre and the pro are not gated out separately, but we have done that in subsequent experiments and there's no difference in either pre or pro B cells. Um, but when you get to immature B cells, you have a significant increase in immature B cells in the bone marrow of offspring born to schisto infected mothers. And then uh, you have a significant decrease of transitional B cells. So what would this mean functionally? Well, these immature B cells, remember, is where you start to do positive selection, right? And so you're looking for uh, BCRs that would react with self-antigen. Um, you know, this is a very important screening process. Um, and so what you lose between these two things would ostensibly be the autoreactive auto B cells. So our hypothesis at the moment that we're still working uh, to, to finalize proving is that you start off with a pool uh, because of this increased skewing towards uh, B cell skewed common lymphoid progenitors. You start off with a pool of more BCRs and they're gonna contain more autoreactive BCRs within that repertoire. And then um, after uh, selection, you now have a restricted smaller pool of BCRs available because you've uh, selected out all of the all of, all of the BCRs that we believe are autoreactive here. Um, and so if you look at EBF1 in these same populations, um, it's not significantly different in the pre-pro B cells, uh, but you do have a significant reduction in the pre and pro B cells, in the, B, in the immature B cells, and in the transitional B cells. Um, so this EBF1 reduction uh, in, in significance is there in the common lymphoid progenitor. And then once you start uh, to go through B cell maturation in the pre and pro B cell stage, you again have this significant reduction in EBF1. Um, and this is where EBF1 is really important, uh, again, particularly for this BCR editing. Um, so if we look at genes in the, uh, we're gonna be looking in these immature B cells here. Um, and so this is single cell RNA-seq. I'm not gonna show you all of the clustering, uh, but this data is from the immature B cell cluster. Um, you can see that there's a significant reduction uh, in expression of, uh, so this is your heat map here for scale, of uh, heavy and light, a light chain genes along with RAG1 um, that in uh, the offspring born to infected mothers, which would again suggest a reduced ability uh, to undergo selection because you have fewer light chain genes expressed, uh, which are really important for that selection process. So I'm gonna stop this story here. I will tell you, we do have, we've identified what we think is the epigenetic mechanism uh, responsible for controlling this. I just don't feel comfortable making it public yet, but hopefully we will be submitting this paper uh, by August. Um, 
So we do believe we understand epigenetically what is controlling this. Um, and so the conclusions from, from what I've shown you so far uh, in our unpublished work, <coughs> excuse me, is that the bone marrow defect starts uh, at the hematopoietic stem cell level. Um, this is antigen driven based on it being dependent on egg antigen exposure. Um, and it skews progenitors towards B cell development uh, as that's your first step of impairment in normal uh, hematopoietic program. Um, and then your next step in impairment is that negative selection is impaired. Um, we think it might be about autoreactive clones. Um, I will tell you we've done um, the BCR sequencing. We're just uh, still working on analysis. We got the first set of BCR sequencing uh, for the peripheral B cells um, back last week and the uh, bone marrow B cells, the BCR sequencing is, is running now. Um, so we'll, we'll have a, a little more information about that. But our preliminary pass at that data analysis in the periphery is that there is a restriction in B cell, uh, BCR clones in peripheral B cells in, the, in a germinal center reaction um, in offspring born to infected mothers. Um, this lower EBF1 in the bone marrow persists throughout differentiation. Um, and I showed you from our published data that we believe it's what's causing the defects in humoral immunity following vaccination. Um, so that is a very tidy story uh, that I, I hope gets you to think about the fact that um, what happens in utero uh, really sets up uh, an offspring for life in terms of the development of the immune system. Um, and it's also uh, was our second story that demonstrated that uh, schistosome antigens can reprogram bone marrow progenitors. Um, and so since it looks like I am for the first time in my life, good on time, um, I'm gonna tell you a little bit about that story so you can understand how broadly the egg antigen driven reprogramming of bone marrow progenitors is uh, in the context of, of schistosomes. Um, so uh, the second project uh, that really focuses on bone marrow progenitor reprogramming is a metabolism project in the lab. Um, and that's rooted in um, the observation that globally helminth infections inversely correlate with metabolic diseases. Um, in the Western world, so the US and Europe, more than 65% of diabetic patients die from cardiovascular complications. Insulin resistance and obesity are two of the most important risk factors for the development of CVD in diabetics. And there is a critical need uh, to develop innovative approaches to reducing the pathology of metabolic diseases. So my lab, along with many others, uh, both in the US and Europe, um, really focus on using helminths as a tool um, to understand uh, the control of metabolism um, and then to, to develop new therapeutics. Uh, so I will show you just three data slides um, about this project, which was also published in PLOS Pathogens. Um, it was published in January. Um, and so it was rooted in observations we made many years ago that were finally published in 2018, um, in that uh, we demonstrated that S. mansoni infection um, dramatically reprograms, uh, in this paper, we were looking at tissue macrophages, liver macrophage metabolism. Um, so you have a reprogramming of the biosynthesis of amino acids, you have a reprogramming of glucagon signaling, you have a reprogramming of cholesterol metabolism. Um, and when you use a, a model of um, diabetic and atherogenic uh, and uh, mice that can get obese, uh, which we use APOE knockout mice for that. Um, infection protects from both the development of uh, diabetes, which we measure by glucose area under the curve here. Um, these are the groups, um, as well as from atherosclerosis. Um, and so after many years of, of trying to focus on, on tissue macrophage uh, responses, um, I made the decision to think about this from a more basal standpoint, um, because we know that in schisto infection, liver macrophages, by the time you're in chronic infection, which is when you get this protection, um, are generated from uh, blood monocyte recruitment into the liver, not from proliferation of tissue resident macrophages. Um, and so we started to go to the source 
of those blood monocytes, which would be bone marrow progenitors. Um, and so this just shows you the model that we use. We use APOE knockout mice um, that are pre-treated uh, on, on high fat diet uh, for the experiments that I'm going to show you. Um, and then infected with asmansoni, and we're taking them at at least 10 weeks post asmansoni infection. Um, we take an integrated approach. I'm not gonna show you for the sake of time, um, all of these data inputs, but they are published in the paper. Again, PLOS pathogens in January. Um, uh, same first author as the other PLOS pathogens, uh, Diana Cortez Selva, who was a rock star graduate student. Um, and so we take an integrated approach to try to understand uh, holistically the control of metabolism uh, in these mice. Um, and so the first observation we made um, was that if you take out bone marrow from APOE knockout mice on high fat diet that are infected, you culture them just with MCSF. So there's no other antigens in the culture. Um, there's a significant increase in both basal oxygen consumption and spare respiratory capacity quantified here which was really exciting to us. Um, because again, these macrophages are generated without antigenic exposure, okay? Um, and also very strikingly that we thought was a clue to what mechanistically could be going on in these cells to, to control this metabolism. We saw a dramatic increase in mitotracker MFI and the mitotracker that we use here um, measures uh, mitochondrial mass. Um, importantly, so you don't have to take my word for it. These cells do not look like they're stimulated with anything. They're only cultured with MCSF and they're not alternatively activated when you look at 206 by 301. Um, they're also not uh, uh, classically activated. Um, so we did a transcriptomic analysis of these cells and uh, we found a lot of metabolic genes as well as genes downstream of interferon gamma. Um, that are significantly upregulated in the macrophages derived from infected bone marrow. Um, and so this shows you some of the genes downstream of interferon gamma that are modulated. Um, so this is not the profile of what you would expect of an alternatively activated macrophage. And from a surface phenotype, they're not alternatively activated. Um, what they do have is a dramatic reprogramming of their lipid metabolism. Um, so we found on the uh, RNA-seq, a significant increase in MGLL, which is a monoacylglycerol lipase, which can generate a free fatty acid, usually palmitate from monoacylglycerol. Um, we validated that with qPCR, and we looked at its functionality using an inhibitor of MGLL, again, in a seahorse assay. And so if we do the same seahorse assay where we're looking at basal oxygen consumption and then spare respiratory capacity, here we're gonna graph the max respiration point of that spare respiratory capacity curve. Um, we see that if you add the MGLL inhibitor to the cells from uninfected males, there's no change in basal oxygen consumption. But when you add it to that, to the cells from infected males, you now bring their basal oxygen consumption down to the same level as those from uninfected males. Same thing with this max respiration. So MGLL is uh, at least partially responsible for the increase in both basal oxygen consumption and spare respiratory capacity that we see in these cells. And again, I wanna reiterate that these cells are not stimulated with schistoantigens. When they're cultured in vitro, they are only cultured with MCSF. Um, so <laughs> that suggested, and there's a whole lot of other data in that paper that I am skipping, um, that I would love for you to, to go check out and read. Um, but that suggested this ability to culture macrophages um, without stimulation with a dramatically altered metabolic profile really suggested that the progenitors um, are what are being reprogrammed and not mature macrophages. Um, so the way in which to establish that, of course, is to transfer those progenitors to an uninfected mouse and see if they're still modulated. And so that's what we did. Um, we pre-treated recipient APOE knockout males on high fat diet for five weeks and then ablated their bone marrow. We did some experiments with busulfan um, and some experiments with lethal irradiation. These, uh, these data in this figure are with busulfan, but they're uh, 
the, the, the trends for every data point are similar with uh, lethal irradiation. And then we gave them back either the bone marrow from a 10 week infected male or from an uninfected male on high fat diet as well. And then we parked that bone marrow for 10 weeks. So now we're looking at 10 weeks post reconstitution. Um, we give them a glucose tolerance test. And again, they've been on high fat diet this entire time. Uh, we see a significant reduction in glucose area under the curve of the males that received uh, infected bone marrow versus those that received uninfected bone marrow. When we take out uh, this bone marrow and culture it in vitro again with just MCSF, um, we see that there's a significant increase. There's an increase in basal oxygen consumption and then a significant increase in uh, spare respiratory capacity as well uh, as graphed here. Um, and this, again, phenocopies, it's not identical uh, in terms of its magnitude, but it phenocopies what we see in an intact mouse. And very importantly, there's this uh, same magnitude of increase of mitotracker MFI. So that suggests that this, when we transfer the bone marrow from an infected male to an uninfected male, at that 10 week time point, the only progenitors that are gonna be left are the long-term progenitors. So short-term progenitors like CMPs and GMPs would have turned over in that 10 week time frame. So again, this really suggests what we're looking at is a reprogramming um, likely upstream of the CMP GMP level. Um, and I have three minutes left. So I'm just gonna show you that um, this myeloid reprogramming is sex dependent. So all of the data that I had previously published back in 2018, that multiple other groups have published in both APOE knockout mice and LDR knockout mice were all done in male mice. Um, so one of my questions for a long time was, does this happen in females? Um, and so we see that females are not protected from obesity uh, or from diabetes when they're infected with S. mansoni. Um, and that's in contrast to males, which are protected from, from all components. Uh, if we look at serum tri and diglycerides as a measure of uh, uh, cardiovascular disease, we can see that males have a significant reduction in serum triglycerides and diglycerides, um, whereas females have a significant increase in triglycerides and then statistically equivalent diglycerides. Right? So the take home from this figure is that males are protected from all three aspects of metabolic disease. Females are not protected from any of the aspects of metabolic disease. Um, and so I alluded with our, our bone marrow chimera experiment that this is reprogramming that really should be taking place at a long-term progenitor level in order to be maintained over the time frame that we've seen it. Um, so we actually started to look at bone marrow progenitors um, and we see that in naive mice, there is a differential ratio of GMPs to CMPs between males and females. After infection, this ratio is maintained. Um, so there's, uh, you have expansion in, in both the males and females here. Um, if we look at absolute numbers, and this is from a frequency standpoint, but if we look at absolute numbers, things get really interesting. So there's no significant change in the absolute numbers of CMPs or GMPs in females, although it does trend higher. Um, but there's a significant decrease of both CMPs and GMPs in the bone marrow of males uh, that are infected with S. mansoni. There's no alteration in the MDP. Um, so if we look at KI67 as a marker of cell cycle progression, um, we can see statistically identical KI67 in CMPs um, but when you get to GMPs, you have a significant increase of GMP positive, of KI67 positive GMPs in the males, infected males, um, but again, no change in females, and there's no change in the MDPs. So if you remember from the first part of the presentation that the LMPPs are able in a FLT3 ligand dependent manner to directly make GMPs, um, we started to, to wonder about LMPPs. Um, and this is driven by there being no cell cycle difference in CMPs. Um, so we looked at uh, the frequency of LMPPs um, and we see they are significantly increased in males, uh, but not in females. And this is also true for the absolute number. Um, and their numbers are about threefold higher in infected males versus uninfected males. Um, and then this is a schematic just to remind you that LMPPs can directly make GMPs in a FLT3 ligand dependent manner. Very importantly, our transcriptomic data of the 
in vitro derived macrophages do show an increase in FLT3. So we do think that the mechanism for this is, is FLT3 uh, driving LMPPs to make GMPs instead of CLPs. Um, and I'm gonna stop that there. Um, and there's a lot, of, a lot of ways in which we are taking both of these projects forward. Um, and they involve uh, both new human maternal schistosomiasis work um, along with expanding our maternal work to understand a broader array of pathogens and um, the, a much broader way in which maternal infections or immunizations can alter the development of offspring immunity. Um, and we're, we're doing that uh, with flu, uh, with COVID um, and with, with tetanus and diphtheria. Um, and I will stop there. These are all of the wonderful people that have helped generate this data. Awesome, thank you so much for that fantastic talk, Kiki. Uh, we have some questions in the chat and usually it takes like a little, little bit of time for people to catch up due to the 10 second delay. So I'll just start you off with one that I was sort of wondering throughout the talk. So it looks like a lot of the key changes are in metabolic pathways, right? Even if, and is that imprinted at the progenitor level, like looking at like a tax seek or something like that? Um, so we're working on a tax seek now. Um, the single cell RNA seq does uh, suggest uh, metabolic progenitor reprogramming. Um, it's not exactly the same as in differentiated cells, which is actually, I wouldn't expect it to be identical um, because activated cells have different needs in terms of generating cytokines and, and other functions. But we have a very consistent um, signature of metabolic reprogramming in the context of egg antigen exposure, whether that's in utero or whether that's an adult mouse that, that we believe is, is happening up at the progenitor level. Great. So I'm gonna start off with a question from Nick. Uh, he says, cool work. Um, he's wondering if the effects on the increase in the B cell lineage um, through hematopoietic development in the bone marrow persist if the cells are transferred to new mice. That's what we're working on right now. Um, so, we are working on both, um, this is harder with neonates than it is with adult mice <laughs> for many obvious reasons. Um, but we are working on, we've done some um, peripheral B cell transfers um, and we're, we're working on some other uh, progenitor transfers, um, getting down to single, single progenitor population sorts. Um, and so we're, we're still working to get them as clean as I would like to answer the question, um, but we're, we're working on that. And then Jared, I think has something in a similar vein for a follow-up because he's asking if you've looked at the functional changes in the ability of HPCs to differentiate on a per cell basis, like on OP9 uh, Delta-1 stroma. Um, right, so we, we do have an in vitro culture uh, method set up um, we have one for HSPC expansion, um, and then we have for differentiation in either toward skewed towards a myeloid or a lymphoid phenotype. Um, and so on, I didn't show this data, but when you put them in towards a lymphoid uh, skewing uh, setting um, in that matrix, uh, you get the same number of B cell clusters, but the clusters are smaller. Um, so there, there does seem to be a defect in that B cell skewing. When we keep them just in HSPCs, when the bone marrow comes from an infected mother, uh, an offspring born to an infected mother, um, you actually, we actually get spontaneous macrophage differentiation um, instead of uh, being fully restricted to HSPCs. Um, and then when they're in uh, myeloid skewing, um, we get many more GMP colonies than we get CMP colonies. And then we get, again, differentiation into mature macrophages. I just didn't show any of that data for, for the time frame. Um, but there does, our, our in vivo data is supported by the in vitro data, um, suggesting that this really is a skewing phenotype in, at the individual HSPC level. Um, we are working on another project uh, that, uh, a grant that an R21 that just started um, to identify the egg antigens that are able to induce uh, the metabolic skewing um, and then 
uh, I'm, I'm using some seed grant money to, to look at uh, the lymphoid skewing as well. And, and Jared has a perfect follow-up to that follow-up, which is exactly what you're talking about, following up on the egg antigens. And he's asking if you think the effects of egg antigen are intrinsic to the hematopoietic progenitor pool, or if there's a functional change to the bone marrow niche that drives the phenotype. Uh, that's, that's a very good question. So um, <clears throat> Lisa has gotten the first set of images that we think are probably going to be good enough. But so we are working on imaging uh, intact, uh, the bones completely intact, to be able to look at the stromal niche directly interacting with uh, progenitors. Um, we've also done some flow um, uh, on, on the Aurora where we can look at the stromal cells at the same time that we can look at, at, uh, lymphoid and myeloid cells. Um, and so we do think that there is both epigenetic reprogramming as well as an alteration in the niche. Um, I will tell you the niche work is likely to not be in this paper <clears throat> and it will, it'll be a separate paper. Um, I'm really trying to keep this paper tightly focused on, on the B cell story, but we are working on that. And we do have evidence that the stromal niche is altered. And IL-4 is made in the bone marrow. <laughs> awesome. Yeah, it looks like a lot of exciting research directions for you and your lab. Really excited to see some more of this stuff uh, come out in the future. And thank you for joining us today. If anyone has any additional questions for Kiki, feel free to put them into the chat and Kiki will uh, monitor this YouTube channel and she can address any questions afterwards. Thank you so much for being here today. Thank you.